transport is um, lifeline of any city and uh, i think that holds good for delhi also and uh, delhi during last 6 uh, 7 years under the leadership of honorable cm arvind kejriwal has uh, taken few bold uh, steps towards uh, making public transport uh, more reliable more safe more clean aur isi disha mein kuch saalon mein jo important jo kaam kiye hain jaise public transport ko kaise safe banaya jaye especially for uh, female passengers i think first time in the world bus marshals uh, on such a large scale were uh, deployed in every bus where agar फीमेल पैसेंजर को अगर कोई भी किसी प्रकार की अगर कोई उसको डिफिकल्टी या अनकंफर्टेबल लगता है तो शी कैन स्टेट अवे अप्रोच द बस मार्शल हर एक बस में सीसीटीवी लगाए गए हैं आज हमारे दिल्ली में जितनी भी बसें हैं उन सभी बसों में मोर देन टू टू थ्री सीसीटीवी कैमराज आर प्लेस्ड एट डिफरेंट लोकेशन हर एक एंगल जो है एंगल से हर एक बस का कोना जो है वो मॉनिटर किया जा रहा है पैनिक बटन आई थिंक इतने बड़े स्केल पे कहीं भी पैनिक बटन uh, इस प्रकार से नहीं लगाए गए हैं अगर फिर दोबारा अगर किसी भी पैसेंजर को एंड स्पेशली द फीमेल पैसेंजर अगर उसको कहीं भी अनकंफर्टेबल लगता है कोई भी प्रॉब्लम है तो स्टेट में वो पैनिक बटन दबाने से विच इज कनेक्टेड टू आर सेंट्रलाइज कमांड सेंटर वहां पे मैसेज आता है मैसेज फ्लैश टू डेली पुलिस ऑल्सो ट्रांसपोर्ट डिपार्टमेंट का जो कंट्रोल रूम है टू द फायर डिपार्टमेंट आल्सो एंड इमीडिएटली जो बस की लोकेशन है उसको कैप्चर करके द पीसीआर कैन रीच विद इन फ्यू मिनट्स जहां पे ये प्रॉब्लम है उसी प्रकार से हमारे जो ईवी पॉलिसी है माननीय सी अरविंद केजरीवाल के नेतृत्व में मेरे ख्याल से मैं गलत नहीं हूंगा ये कहने में कि मोस्ट कॉम्प्रिहेंसिव मोस्ट डायनेमिक जो इलेक्ट्रिक व्हीकल पॉलिसी अगर कहीं कंसीव की गई है और ना सिर्फ कंसीव बल्कि उसको कैसे ग्राउंड पे जाके उसको एग्जीक्यूट किया गया है आई थिंक डेली व्हीकल पॉलिसी इज द मोस्ट आउटस्टैंडिंग व्हीकल पॉलिसी इन द एंटायर वर्ल्ड एंड वी हैड वेरी गुड रिजल्ट्स ओवर द पास्ट वन वन एंड हाफ ईयर्स यू कैन सी लॉर्ड ऑफ व्हीकल्स रनिंग ऑन डेली रोड ना और हरेक जो एक इलेक्ट्रिक व्हीकल दिल्ली की सड़कों पे दौड़ता है यकीन कीजिए वो आप सोचिए कितना पोल्यूशन जो है वो कट करता है इसी प्रकार से हमने जो ओपन डेटा जो ट्रांजिट हमारे जो बसों का है उसको भी जो हमने लॉन्च किया लगभग दो ढाई साल की मेहनत के बाद गूगल से पार्टनरशिप करके आज बड़े हम गर्व के साथ कह सकते हैं कि हमारी रियल uh, टाइम जो लोकेशन है uh, बस की कोई भी यात्री अपने फोन के माध्यम से वो उसको कहीं भी uh, खड़ा होकर देख सकता है कि जो बस uh, जिससे वो यात्रा करना uh, चाह रहा है वो कितनी दूर पे है कितनी दूरी पे है uh, वो बस कौन से स्टॉप से uh, निकली है और कौन से बस स्टॉप पे पहुंचेगी वो बिल्कुल रियल टाइम लोकेशन वो देख सकता है uh, तो ये कुछ चीजें हैं जो uh, uh, हमने पिछले सालों में किया इसके साथ साथ ट्रांसपोर्ट को और कैसे सेफ बनाया जाए जैसे ब्लैक स्पॉट्स को हमने आइडेंटिफाई किया उनको दूर करने के लिए हमने अलग अलग कंसल्ट टेंट्स को के साथ काम किया डब्ल्यू के साथ बहुत अच्छे कोऑर्डिनेटेड वे में हमने उनको काम किया टेक्निकल एडवाइजर के रूप में डब्ल्यू ने बहुत अच्छे तरीके से दिल्ली सरकार के साथ कंधे से कंधा मिलाकर काम किया है चांदनी चौक एक हमारा जो हिस्टोरिकल एरिया है और बहुत ही कंजेस्टेड एरिया है उसको पेडिस्ट्रियन के लिए किस प्रकार से सेफ बनाया जाए आई थिंक उसमें डब्ल्यू की बहुत अहम भूमिका रही है और आज अगर आप देखेंगे तो वो सारा एरिया को पूरा ब्यूटिफाई करके उसको बिल्कुल व्हीकल से फ्री कर दिया गया है ताकि अगर कोई भी व्यक्ति उस पर चलना चाहे सैर करना चाहे उस एरिया को एक्सप्लोर करना चाहे तो बिना किसी टेंशन के वो उस पूरा एक पेडिस्ट्रियन जोन की तरह उसको डिक्लेयर किया गया है तो ये कुछ चीजें एंड वी विल कंटिन्यू टू स्ट्राइव टूवर्ड्स 
the goal of making uh, Delhi one as honorable CM has said many times uh, EV capital not not only of India but of of the world and second uh, to make uh, Delhi public transport system one of the best uh, systems in in the world which will be clean safe and reliable. Over the last 5-6 years, Delhi government has been very proactively coming up with innovations and reforms in the public transport sector, uh, be it uh, investing in better quality buses, uh, innovations like the common mobility car, route rationalization, putting CCTVs in buses uh, to increase women safety, putting bus marshals in buses. All of these investments are being made so that people of Delhi find it convenient as well as affordable to uh, use public transport. Uh, at the same time, our efforts have also been on trying to bring in zero emissions mobility through one of the most progressive electric vehicle policies uh, globally. Uh, to this end, uh, last year, in August of 2020, Delhi government notified the Delhi TV policy. This policy was had a very big ambition that uh, Delhi will emerge as an EV capital uh, by 2024, uh, wherein 25% of all newly registered vehicles will be EVs. And it laid down a very progressive roadmap of how we will get there. Uh, in the framing of the policy itself, we worked with many partners and experts uh, in India and around the world. Uh, WRI, uh, we have been having a long association with WRI for many public transport reforms, but also during the conceptualization stage of the EV policy. Uh, today, Delhi's EV policy has four or five major pillars. First and foremost is financial incentives. Uh, we are giving generous financial incentives, especially for two and three wheelers up to 30,000 rupees uh, and for four wheelers up to one and a half. Uh, we are also giving non-financial incentives. We are encouraging electric autos to be registered in Delhi. We are promoting bike taxis. Many of these reforms are still in progress. But uh, with the coming of these reforms, the entire sector for EVs is looking that, like it will be opening up in a very big way. The third is third important pillar is charging infrastructure. We all know that charging infrastructure is one of the big reasons why EVs haven't taken off in India. Again over here, Delhi government is uh, undertaking many efforts. Uh, we are uh, already come out with a tender to set up 100 public charging stations at very prominent parts of Delhi. And we are also uh, empaneling uh, charging providers uh, so that private uh, uh, spaces like malls, restaurants can have a win single window facility to install charges at their premises. Uh, at the same time, we are also looking at aspects of battery recycling uh, and disposal so that uh, eventually the promise of environment friendly transport is realized. And finally, I would talk about the need for generating public awareness because we've realized that you know governments can come out with better policies but unless you are going to address the concerns of the consumers which the industry also needs to do but the governments can also come up with innovative campaigns to uh, ensure that people understand the benefits of electric vehicles to this end earlier this year in february with the support of wri uh, delhi government launched a very prominent campaign called switch delhi where we're encouraging people to uh, move away from polluting vehicles and adopt cleaner electric vehicles. It was an eight-week campaign, uh, multimedia campaign through TV advertisements, radio spots, codings and outreach to community organizations like RWAs. Uh, we did a lot of sensitization. And because of all these efforts, we are happy to note that despite being a difficult year of a pandemic, uh, the share of electric vehicles in the first year of Delhi's EV policy uh, has increased from 1.2 percentage uh, to 3.3 percentage. This is a, a huge jump and uh, hopefully in the coming years we will be able to achieve a target of uh, 25 percentage share of EVs in uh, uh, all the vehicles. In the coming year as well, Delhi government has very uh, ambitious plans uh, from uh, starting the shift to EVs. This is when the next year is when we will see this huge acceleration happen. Uh, we've already announced plans for our entire government fleet to transition into EVs, which will be more than 3,000 or 4,000 four-wheelers. 
um, we are going to be soon launching an electric auto scheme where 4000 electric autos will be plying on the streets of Delhi. This is again going to be the largest of its kind scheme anywhere in India. And uh, we will see a very, very wide deployment of charging infrastructure. The, all the planning and uh, preparation that was going on for the last year will finally culminate in the next year. So we are very happy to have reached this point uh, to be amongst the leading cities in India that are driving the transition to EVs. And all of this has been possible because of partners like WRI who have been supporting us in multiple ways, be it charging infrastructure, be it public awareness campaign, and, and overall advisory support that we have uh, received from them. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session on the story of Chandni Chok pedestrianization. Uh, my name is Amit Bhatt, and I'll be the moderator of this session today. And we have some great speakers who have joined us to share their experience on this whole very important topic of how do you create streets for people. So let me introduce the speakers first. Uh, first, we have Ms. Garima Gupta, IS. Uh, she is the Managing Director of Shah Janabad Redevelopment Corporation, Delhi. Uh, we welcome you, ma'am, uh, to this session. Uh, we also have Mr. Rishav Gupta, IS. Uh, Mr. Gupta is the CEO of Indoor Smart City. Thanks a lot, Mr. Gupta, for joining us. And we have Chidam uh, Korek Ostas. Uh, she is the Urban Development and, Ac and Accessibility Manager at WRI Turkey. So thanks a lot, Chidam, for joining us uh, virtually from Turkey. So today uh, we'll be hearing three international, three interesting case examples. One, Shah Janabad, uh, which has been in news for last many months and specifically last week or so. Uh, then we'll also be hearing uh, what Indore is planning to do on pedestrianizing. And then Chidam will talk a little bit more about how they went ahead and in Istanbul and in fact converted the entire historic peninsula pedestrian friendly. But before we start the discussion, let me invite my colleague Priyanka Shukla, uh, to make a background presentation first. Priyanka, over to you. to see some fantastic work. Uh, but I'll just raise a few questions for the audience also to think about. Um, so first, like, when we talk about creating uh, you know, streets for people, is this for people? A very simple question. Uh, doesn't seem so, it looks like for cars. And looking at this image, is this for people? Well, at least, you know, here we see some people, um, but it is basically designed for them. Oh, no, no, it's not. Just a leftover space with a carriageway, you know, which was occupied. So let's understand what are the complete streets and, you know, what are the major components of complete street? It has majorly four components. And the first one, of course, is what we all are aware about. It's a motorized zone where we have, you know, the buses, the auto rickshaws, and majorly we all think yeah, it's, it's for cars, but there are two wheelers and, and similar, you know, in, in various kind of uh, uh, vehicles, uh, especially in the context of South Asian cities. Um, but the second most important uh, component, which we kind of, we all are aware of, and but we don't, you know, acknowledge is non-motorized uh, component. And, and where the, we have pedestrians, we have cyclists, we have vendors, you know, uh, we have landscaping, we have utilities. Um, and this is something which we don't provide space for, but it is there. It occupies its space on, the, on its own. The second, uh, the third, of course, is something which we don't, uh, you know, um, understand and, and uh, but actually impacts a lot because that's what decides that how functional you know, the structure uh, would be for the street. The third are the edges, that what are the building edges uh, to the street. And fourth, but not the, you know, not the least, last one, but not the least is the connectors. Now, ignoring and, and missing this component is something which is very, very ironic for our cities because we are all, you know, working for connecting our cities uh, to, to major streets. But we are missing this important connection of, you know, connecting one edge to another edge, which is adding more, uh, you know, issues. So I'll quickly go to that. Then what, do, what are we talking about? If we, these are the four components. What exactly is we telling? We're saying that we don't need to have any template for designs. We actually need to look into the contextual approach. 
And that is why when we look into the top left image, we see that there are so many pedestrians there. How the street should be is the topic which we're going to discuss today. So it has to be pedestrianization because when we see 90% or more or even you know, 70 or 80% sometimes in pedestrians walking, we have to look into the streets which are specifically designed for them. So what is pedestrianization? So pedestrianization means converting a street or an area into a public space for the use of pedestrians, which is very simple. You know, we're reclaiming space for pedestrians. But is it like an isolated technical measure? No, it is strongly interrelated with the models which we need to adopt, which is prioritizing our pedestrians you know, overall in our scheme. And so is it a new concept? Now, people ask that why do we remove uh, vehicles? Why do we want to remove? Of course, we have a lot of benefits which you're going to discuss ahead right now. But is it a real question? No, pedestrianization is not a new concept. You know, one of the first cars accessible for the masses was only in 1908, which means cars are only 100 years old. So importantly, the ancient and medieval streets were designed for pedestrians and not only. So we are not kind of, you know, re-establishing anything. We are just re-establishing our, our relationship with these streets, which are, which are always like this. So why do we need it? Simply because congestion is real. And on average, a car occupies 20 times more space than a pedestrian. So when we talk about, you know, providing spaces for our customers, we actually see that, you know, the road users, 90% of when there are pedestrians, the space given to them is not even 20%. So if that is the ratio we are going to use for our streets for designing, then how do, how do we expect for their efficiency? Then is it inclusive for our customers? You know, when we go to the streets, how many of, you know, women are comfortable? And, and there are many markets which have kind of, you know, noticed that regularly women customers have drastically reduced and they prefer to go to mall. And, and the question comes in that, you know, it is difficult to walk while, while shopping, but is it actually true? I mean, we have malls which are kilometer long and specifically in Delhi, NCR and all these areas. But whenever we try and convert any street into pedestrian and pedestrian only, see, the question is that we can't walk long, but that's not true. And, you know, this is my last slide very quickly. I've kind of wind up, but why do people go to mall? Or why do people go to mall? Because it's comfortable. They have, you know, spaces to sit around and that's what they enjoy with the families. They, they don't see people loading and loading in front of the market streets or, you know, the shopkeepers are coming with their vehicles in front of the street. So it's a, it's a very basic. So I'll just, uh, you know, uh, would like to end Amit here in terms of that, um, that, you know, while the streets are stuck with vehicles and they're competing with these malls, we need to realize that how malls have utilized this, you know, the, the fact that people are going to come out to public spaces for socializing. And we have to design the streets for, for that to be inclusive, sustainable uh, and safe. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot, Priyanka. And I really like the last slide where you said, in fact, the malls are all pedestrian-only spaces. And while we really talk and really struggle to pedestrianize our markets, we are very happy to walk uh, without vehicles inside the mall. So thanks a lot for highlighting it. So people who are joining us, uh, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box. Uh, you can type in your questions as the speakers present, and we'll try to take this question with the respective uh, speakers. Okay, so let's move forward and uh, let me invite Mr. Garima Gupta, Ms. Garima Gupta, to share the whole Shah Janabad presentation Thank story you. with us. Uh, that's something which we, we, all of us are very excited to hear about. Over to you, Garima, ma'am. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I hope my uh, presentation is visible to all. Yes? Yes, we can see the presentation. So, I'm going to speak about the uh, Chandni Chowk redevelopment. Chandni Chowk redevelopment, essentially, the Chandni Chowk is a street, is a small stretch of the street, 1.5 kilometer street from the Red Fort to the... Ma'am, can you please make the presentation in a uh, 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 full screen mode? It's, Sorry? Can you make the presentation full screen? Yes. Yeah, that will be great. Can you see it now in the full screen mode? Yes. Uh, so, slideshow, uh, if you go down right hand corner, I, down. is it uh, visible in the full screen? No. So, one minute. Who could be Joe Jara Joy? One minute. Sure. Full screen. Slide show. Hmm. Hmm. 
right hand corner below uh, there is a small slide show button next to the minus sign niche niche unko man minus sign ke bagal wala button is ko bas is this okay yeah 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 got it usko click kar dijiye please so uh, you know as yes done already i hope it's visible now sure ma'am you can go ahead. yeah perfect am i audible yes ma'am we can hear you as priyanka has already spoken about why pedestrianization so what is pedestrian uh, the hybrid pedestrian models sorry hello am i audible yes ma'am we can hear you Am I audible? I think we lost the connection. Yeah. Okay, so I think we lost uh, the connection with Garima, ma'am. So maybe let's move a little forward. Uh, maybe I'll invite uh, Mr. Rishabh Gupta. Uh, the uh, he's the CEO of Indoor Smart City to share his experience. Uh, and then we will go to ms garima over to you rishabh sir am i audible yes we can hear you sir okay uh, is the screen visible yes we can see the screen okay great okay so let me talk about chappan dukan model so basically what is chappan dukan chappan dukan is equivalent ya to chandni chowk ki paranthe wali gali dekhi hogi aapne ya fir heritage street of amritsar it is the equivalent such street in indore so it's always hustling and bustling with people initially there were 56 shops rented by imc the indore municipal corporation over there and it has been a historic place over the years it gained popularity because of the quality of the fast food that was being served over there but in spite of having gained the popularity as well as high amount of footfall the infrastructure on that street was very poor some of the major issues that we faced included half a dozen parking over there there was no shared area for people to actually go and sit in the shade and eat some food there was no greenery over there there was not even a street furniture the pedestrian movement was very haphazardous there was no lighting vehicular traffic was there and due to all those dust and everything it was basically a place for unhealthy eating also disposables ka jab se rivaj chala तब से कचरा बहुत बढ़ गया वहां पर तो इन शॉर्ट वी बेसिकली रिड्यूस्ड अ गुड स्ट्रीट टू अ प्लेस विच वॉज एक्चुअली इम प्रॉपर फॉर हेल्दी ईटिंग सो देन द कॉन्सेप्ट केम अप दैट यस वी शुड गो एंड रीडिफाइन दिस होल एरिया द विजन वॉज टू मेक दिस ऑल द यूटिलिटीज अंडरग्राउंड द लाइटिंग should be synchronized there should be proper shade there should be proper green sitting areas all in all there should be a healthy environment where people can go and eat parking should be there and <clears throat> on top of it 
it should be a no vehicle zone so that people can go like in traditional hearts they can roam around eat around and then have a good gala time so a design proposal was made we <clears throat> the major focus of the design was that there should be a common facade a common facade is again very necessary for any food street because if we do not have a proper marking then the exit points or basically the facade of all the shops becomes hazardous kuch log apni dukane aage laga lete hain kuch piche kar lete hain the whole beauty of the place is reduced secondly our main focus was that it should be a place where people should feel safe so our main focus was on surveillance no vehicle zone was very necessary because daily there was some or the other incidents with two wheelers or four wheelers so with all that in mind we started with this project so this was the concept aerial view of the whole <coughs> food street the first thing because we wanted to make this a no vehicle zone we involved traffic department in this so as to make a whole new traffic plan we can we should be able to divert the traffic we used to take that road in order to reach the other part of the town so first we made some intervention made people part of it so that people could acclimatize to the new traffic scenario second most important part whenever we talk about no vehicle zone we should always think about parking solutions so the mechanized parking was implemented over there such that there are no vehicles which are standing on the main road due to the street becoming no vehicle zone then the important part was the financial modeling the whole capital cost of the project was around 7 cr but we wanted to make this a sustainable effort so <clears throat> three things we thought of first betterment charges basically the increase of footfall in the whole shopping complex whole eateries which was increased by say around 5 to 6 times the increase of revenue was shared with the smart city second the parking charges were levied on the vehicles coming over there and thirdly digital advertisement through screens as well as the top of the facade of each shop they were used so as to make this model financially viable also sure sir these are now actual site images to so, jaisa vision kiya tha exactly waisa banane ka prayas kiya and the most important thing uh one of the most important thing in such a project is that we should not hamper the economic activity for a long time just because a project is being made or it is in execution for a long time so we made it a point that because it's named 56 dukan we set the timer to 56 days and we promised the city that we shall return you this commercial hub in 56 days we were able to make the whole concept in mere 53 days and then we hand it over so this was the project i want Thank to you talk so about the pedestrian <coughs> the pedestrian project uh it is our hallmark pedestrian project now we see that this place has become the hot spot for youth it is the place where people go when india wins a match or india wins a medal so this is like the india gate of indore now excellent excellent so i think this is one project which we are very proud of and 
a shining example of how we should promote pedestrianism thank you thanks a lot uh, richard sir excellent and uh, fantastic uh, work that you have done in indore uh, since we are running behind schedule i will just quickly jump ask uh, garima ma'am to restart her presentation and then we can take some questions my apologies i got disconnected i had some network issues so sure ma'am please go ahead yes so is the presentation visible now yes ma'am we can see the slides yes so when we were talking about pedestrianization the model of pedestrianization that we chose was the hybrid uh, pedestrianization because we did not pedestrianize the street for 24 hours we pedestrianized it for 9 am to 9 pm because as you would know chandni chowk is a live market and uh, it is a residential area as well and a lot of people staying in and uh, with the hospital school so we could not completely pedestrianize the area so we chose the timing from 9 am to 9 pm nas priyanka has already highlighted that most of the infrastructure which is created in our country is for uh, people who are owners of four wheelers and two wheelers which is less than 5% of our population and most of the people uh, 90% approximately 85 to 90% of the people are the ones which travel on foot or travel using public uh, conveyance and uh, we never create our infrastructure for them so this was uh, considered area so chani chowk uh, most of us have seen it as one of the most iconic markets of delhi and uh, the street was uh, facing issues of congestion and the transformers uh, were placed right on the footpaths in front of the shops commodity shops majorly uh, clothes and all and therefore there were multiple incidents of fire which would uh, cause a lot of damage to life and property also there were uh, frequent encroachments uh, of squatters around the transformers in the footpath area giving a very shabby look to the market uh, crime was on a rise and there were multiple safety concerns in the area the uh, space which is available was so less that it was not uh, distributed uh, equitably uh, chandni chowk as we know is one of the most iconic markets one of the uh, ancient markets we have a heritage associated with it history involved with it we had an imageability of the market to be kept so along with the beautification pedestrianization we wanted the heritage conservation as well uh, the utilities uh, toilets uh, the transformers the fire hydrants the uh, water uh, the delhi jal board connections they were all scattered haphazardly as and when development happened they were just placed without uh, application of mind resulting into a very uh, skewed development and lot of uh, side effects uh, were there it was not a user friendly market at all before the pedestrianization could happen a uh, lot of old uh, people women children used to shy away from uh, entering into the street as well and um, despite of the fact that we were trying a lot of uh, public connectivity to the area the last mile connectivity to the shops was missing the air quality uh, index was going from bad to worse and uh, it was visible in the google also that the entire area was suffering congestion and a very poor air quality and therefore we were not able to fully utilize the economic potential of the area as in any uh, market space we know that it is people who shop not the vehicles and uh, vehicles need 10 to 12 times more uh, space for mobility than people and uh, if we create spaces for pedestrians they would uh, these places would accommodate more people more people means more shoppers more customers more uh, you know boost to the economy more sales to the shopkeepers obviously the property value of the area goes up and uh, the tax revenue in general to the government increases these are the factors which you have to keep in mind when you have to convince a government to spend some money Uh, with the government would shell out some money to the project of redevelopment only with it knows when it knows that there are takeaways to the project uh this is the street which we redevelop this is 1.3 kilometers to be precise from the red fort junction to the uh, to the uh, patepuri mosque and uh, these are the various google images of the street as you can see across uh, years and this is how the street looks now and it used to be very very severely congested street with a poor air quality and uh, with the redevelopment uh, this was then and as we move now the street uh, the air quality has improved the street has improved with the streetscaping and creation of uh, sustainable spaces there if we talk about the historical context of the chandni chowk this is how on the left if you would see chandni chowk 
with the water channel in uh, middle would look at the time of Mughal era when Begum Jahara had planned it. At that time, there was this Nehre Fairs which used to run through the spine of the street. And uh, this Neher was closed, obviously, during the British era. And on the right, you can see that the Chandi Chowk, which was there during the British era with the Neher closed. Then uh, this was one of these uh, ancient structures, Havelis on the left, which is still there in the Chandi Chowk. A lot of these Havelis have dilapidated and because of encroachments and go-downs and shopkeepers coming in, one, one cannot see these structures existing. Only after we've opened up the streets, some of these structures have become visible now. And on the right side is the clock tower and the town hall plaza, which still exists. This is Chandni Chowk as on uh, date. And as we all know, it's a multimodal hub. The street, uh, you know, it has all kinds of people using it. There are pedestrians. Then there are NMVs, uh, cycle rickshaws, auto rickshaws, hard tailors, which are majorly used for transportation of goods to the shop, shops, and then e-rickshaws. And of course, then there are four wheelers also. Besides cars, earlier when pedestrianization was not there, even heavy vehicles used to enter the street. We did a lot of analysis of the beneficiaries uh, who would be involved in the project at the project of beautification and redevelopment was taken up and uh, we realized that each one had something to gain from the project, not only the people who had shops, but people who were residents of the area, people who regularly commute to the area to buy uh, things because Chandni Chowk has got all kinds of commodities one can think of, it's a wholesale market. Civic agencies would find it easy to maintain the area, it would obviously become a tourist spot because of the heritage value which is there in the area. There are schools and hospitals in the area. And of course, we need to cater to these aspects for the residents as well. And it would help the political representatives from the area, multiple uh, political parties and multiple layers of governments. Governance exists uh, in the city and all of them would stand to benefit from the redevelopment project. The idea uh, of success behind any redevelopment project when you're not closing a market area and redeveloping it, pedestrianizing is first have a discussion, especially in terms of Delhi, wherein, wherein there are multiple agencies involved. There is no one single line of command. Also, there are multiple stakeholders involved. As I've already said, there were, this area is a residential come commercial area. So there were residents involved and there were shop owners, there were laborers, there were hard tailor owners, there were uh, people who would go there as tourists, people who would go there as shoppers. There were multiple uh, associations of the uh, Vyaparis, Mandals were existing. So we had to do a uh, multiple stakeholder consultation at various levels so that the whole hallmark of the project was during the three years of execution of the project, we never faced any strike or dharna or any kind of lookout or band from any association because there are multiple associations existing there. there. I'm talking of shopkeepers association, I'm talking of the Mazdoor association, I'm talking of the Hatkila association, Riksha association, all such associations across various strata of society. We did a research of best practices all across the world, spoke to a lot of people on the ground, took their feedback, and then we started moving ahead with the project. So we defined our scope of the work. What was uh, the street stretch which had to be uh, beautified, pedestrianized? Call for an open tender to appoint consultant. The DPR was submitted in the uh, year 2017, January. Then most of the time, because the actual work began in December 2018 and all such time was utilized in the stakeholder consultation and I reiterate that was the backbone of success of our project. We had about uh, 17 various agencies which were involved in the uh, entire project and as I said earlier there is no one single line of command in Delhi and all these agencies report do not report to each other they have different channels of reporting to bring these all various stakeholders under one umbrella and to take them all along was a humongous task for us, but we could successfully do that and uh, finally obtain the project approval by, by a body called UTPEC, which is chaired by none other than Honorable Lieutenant Governor Delhi. I would say again that this project, the success of this project was a result of the administrative acumen because from the very beginning, the project lagged the political will because the project has been uh, into uh, the, the SRDC body, the SPV had been enforced since 2008, but uh, the project and the project uh, foundation stone was laid in 2011, but nothing could take off. So everybody had given up on the project, even the local people had given up on the project. So it is uh, administrators who believed in the project. We had to be at it. We had to take all the stakeholders along, various agencies along. 
and uh, we used the media and court because as you know that whenever you dig a hammer to any street in uh, the country there is always a litigation involved but we used the litigation and courts to our benefit so much so that towards the end of the project the courts had so much faith in us that whenever there used to be an inspection report submitted that used to come as a part of the order of the courts and they would say that if it does not comply by the agency so we got that kind of support from the uh media therefore we did not face any uh, such uh, thing the highest point was we showcased it as a tableau on the 26th january the republic day parade as a um, this is again a very complicated process for selection, but we can make it. The key interventions is now the street is pedestrianized from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Motor vehicles will only move in after 9 p.m. to early morning. We have created loading unloading bays for the shopkeepers to bring their, because as I said, this is a wholesale market and a lot of commodities need to move in. We have uh, prioritized pedestrians. We have created the NMT lanes and footpath at the same level, which will help people to move around. Accessibility elements have been incorporated in the, um, in the street. We have also upgraded the existing utilities like the drains, fire hydrants, street lights. We have taken care of public amenities like toilets. Enough uh, number of toilets have been there, police posts, police booth. Also, we have done streetscaping by placing street furniture of benches as well as the bollards, which would double up as stools for the commuters and shoppers to sit upon. We have dedicated lay -by, dedicated laybys for the emergency vehicles. And multilingual signages. We have put our signages in Urdu, Punjabi also to take care. We have a very uh, detailed traffic management plan in place so as to ensure that there is no choking on the arterial roads also. And we have ensured barricading on the entry exit so as to see that no vehicles enter during the, uh, the uh, NMD zone uh, area. This is the typical street layout. We have two carriageways on both the sides, which are approximately 5.5 meter wide. Uh, this length varies. Uh, this width varies across the length because obviously the typical nature of the street could not be changed. But uh, with clearing of all the uh, squatters and uh, all encroachments, we have been able to widen the street quite a bit. Central median is approximately 3.5 uh, meters wide and we have uh, approximately 5.5 to 6 meters wide footpath. The uh, uh, hallmark of the project was we never did a street around the street, they were all preserved. It's a typical cross section. Transformers have been placed on the central median. We had to fight the Delhi Urban Arts Commission. We believe that placing of transformers on the central median would spoil the skyline of the city. But I must tell you that we had done a study to find out whether we could do undergrounding of the transformers. And DMRC had conducted a, a details uh, study for about six months. But because of the fact that the yellow line of the DMRC was passing through the area and also the trunk sewer, the road, uh, ancient trunk sewer, the oldest trunk sewer of Delhi, 100 years old, was passing through the area and we could not uh, afford to damage it. And hence there was no possibility of putting the transformer underground and therefore the transformers. But they are beautifully camouflaged on the central median. We have put a lot of planters around them and they merge with the architecture of the area. And now it doesn't look as if there is something which is placed right in the center. This is just because there were a couple of media reports saying that Chandni Chok has all lal lal kar diya hai, to be lal pila hai. So just to give you an idea of the fact that we have applied mine to place what nature of stone, what kind of sandstone, what kind of material is to be used. It's very carefully chosen thing. Every we have on the central median placed the granite in a form of a manner that it gives a ripple. It's called a ripple tile effect because there used to be a neher where they could not now afford to place a water body right in the center of the uh, street and therefore. Something similar to it we tried to create by placing the granite stones. Also, we have created plazas. This was an intersection on the left side, right in front of the town hall. And this is now the plaza, which is going to come up. These are the street furnitures. As I said, that long discussions went into choosing uh, the uh, color, the uh, design of the uh, street furniture, the place where would they would be placed. This is all uh, keeping in mind the uh, architecture of the Red Fort and the area so that the heritage is preserved and it does not look haphazardly, just uh, randomly placed uh, furniture. This is, uh, I'm just showcasing the traffic management plan of the area. The red is the stretch of the, stretch of the street, which is uh, totally pedestrianized. And we have uh, barricaded the entry exit point so that to prevent the four wheelers to enter. 
This is some of the pictures of the work in progress, which started in 2018, December. We faced a lot of uh, hurdles in between, including the COVID pandemic and the lockdown due to this, but we could successfully manage to complete it within the scheduled timeline along with all these stakeholders. These are a few pictures which will show you the difference before and after as Priyanka was talking about the streets for people. In the earlier pictures, you can see that the street is totally occupied by four wheelers. You can't see people moving right now. People love to walk on the street. These are all the same places almost from different angles, but the red port is now visible. We have a visual integrity from Red Fort to Fatehpuri Mosque. This is uh, now how it looks during the night. This is the Gurdwara Seaskant in Janne Chowk. All the overhead hanging wires have been taken away and they have been undergrounded. Um, all the fire hydrants have been placed on the sides. These are the bullards, sandstone bullards. This is the German ambassador's incognito visit, and he was really impressed by the redevelopment. And this is what he had to say. I'd just like to play, play, play Karnazar. Just play, play, play. I am sorry, I'm not able to play the clip, but uh, maybe I'll try it later. This finally, the project attained culmination and was inaugurated by Chief Minister Delhi on 12th of September. And uh, I invite all of you to just come have a look, walk on the street, and feel the experience. Now, the outcomes, as you know, that we have been able to build an image for the street. It's absolutely clean, comfortable to walk on. A lot of people, women, old men, old citizens, children are walking. It's sustainable because we have, we have a facility management service provider who's been cleaning the street regularly. Also, a lot of business has increased in the area. The property prices have gone up and it's a healthy street because as I said, there is a lot of green area and people are walking around on the street. The air quality has definitely improved. These are a few other benefits of the street that uh, you know we can just we are having a plan of further developing it as a tourist spot, having night walks and heritage walks organized because there are specific places in Old Delhi Chandni Chowk which are known for their uh, the, the hotels, the restaurants, known for their food specific items. People come looking for those places. It has increased the accessibility and uh, it is now going to enhance uh, as a cultural activity hub. And um, if you go and visit uh, Chani Chowk at night now, even at 12, people are taking a stroll on the street and it's just like uh, any other country in the night. And it does look as if uh, it is in the center of the heart of the old Delhi. 30% sale of the area has increased. And of course, it has led to increase in the overall taxation to the government, the rise in the property value. And uh, the enhanced user fee to the area will cause obviously uh, more gain to the government and uh, public transport revenue will increase. And these are the takeaways for the government from the project because government which invests certain amount of money looks at what it has to take away from the project. And for people in general, obviously we have been able to uh, get hold of the uh, fire accidents which were happening too often and road crashes which were too frequent in the area and public health in general has improved. As I said, there were multifarious challenges in the uh, project. There was a stakeholder consultation, multi-agency uh, coordination, and we did not close the market even for a single day. It was live market and we stayed there. And we had to preserve the heritage of the area. This is the learning I feel we can take away from the other cities that majorly the backbone is a stakeholder consultation. We get to take along everybody. We have to be at it. We have to believe in the project. We all, all of us involved in the project, which was a very really small, lean team. We believed in ourselves and believed in the success of the project. We could manage to convince others also. It was not a smooth ride, as I said. All what could go wrong went wrong with the project. We had NGT orders banning construction activities in Delhi. We had COVID pandemic. We had riots wherein all the workers fled the scene. But when we kept at it, and along with the, all the multi agencies, the uh, biases, we were able to achieve a success in the project. But this is not where we stop. We have a lot of things to go ahead with. We are planning a uh, complete NMT for the Shah Jahanabad zone, uh, improvement of the peripheral roads, we set up the Esplanade Road, Tadar Bazaar, Khadi Bhavli, the inner street developments, also restoration of Fasad, redevelopment of the Jama Masjid recent, Red Fort area redevelopment, and the streetscaping, 
And we have to obviously the biggest challenge is rehabilitation of the homeless areas, home to a lot of homeless of Delhi. These are my coordinates in case I would be happy to share whatever somebody wants to know about the project. These are the details. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot, ma'am, for sharing some incredible, incredible uh, stories from Shah Jahanabad Personalization Project. Uh, so, okay, let's move to the next speaker, Chidem. Uh, Chidem, uh, if you could also talk a little bit more about uh, the historical Peninsula Personalization Project, and then we can have some more Q&A as we are getting some questions from the audience. Over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon from Turkey. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for that. And I'm going to share two um, projects uh, now. Uh, the, one of them is a historical peninsula project from Istanbul. <clears throat> Sorry for that. And the other is uh, Izmir uh, Kemeralto project. Uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, some of you may know that Istanbul is the uh, most crowded city uh, in Turkey with a population of 16 million people. Uh, and the historic peninsula holds the oldest settlement of Istanbul, dating more than uh, 800 uh, years back. Uh, it includes uh, diverse historical, uh, architectural, cultural and social assets. And uh, it is in the UNESCO heritage list. Uh, size of the area is uh, 500 hectares and uh, two and a half million people are walking through the streets of the historic peninsula every day. It's very, very crowded in the uh, daytime. Uh, and uh, the chaotic network of old and narrow streets, because it dates back very, very uh, historic times. Uh, so uh, it gives the charm. Uh, but it makes it challenging to access the functions in the area. So uh, in uh, 2010, uh, local administration, uh, Istanbul Metropolitan Municipality decided to uh, remake this area and they reached to WRI Turkey and Yale architects from Copenhagen uh, to uh, study on this area. And we uh, conducted a pedestrianization project. It's named uh, Istanbul Public Space Public Life Project. You can Google it and find the report uh, easily. Uh, and in order to expand uh, sustainable mobility and uh, create a more accessible historic peninsula for Istanbul. Uh, within the scope of the study, many analyses uh, has made, such as surveys, uh, as the previous uh, presentations uh, shared, uh, surveys to uh, students, residents, um, and the tourists uh, to the area, uh, to using this area, and pedestrian and vehicle counts are made, uh, activity counts uh, and observations in public spaces were made. And suggestions were also developed based on these analyses. The most emphasized suggestion was the pedestrian pedestrianization of this space uh, so that the municipality started to pedestrianize the streets starting from five main squares. It was the core uh, decision to starting from the squares. And uh, they started to pedestrianize uh, the periphery of the uh, squares. And then today we have uh, more than 300 streets uh, pedestrianized in that area. It's a huge number. And in order to support the pedestrian project, um, they also make the site management project for tourist buses because uh, there are many tourists in there and many um, uh, hotels and uh, other areas for that. that. And park, parking area management studies are made also and shuttle route project is also made. Uh, today, the area continues to attract a lot of uh, tourists and trade activities in the region are carried out on a much more regular basis uh, because of this uh, implementation. And the satisfaction rate of businesses in the region from pedestrianization is uh, more than uh, 85%. And after that, uh, Izmir, Izmir project is uh, the other project of uh, WRI Turkey. Uh, Izmir is the third biggest city in Turkey with um, 4 million uh, people. Uh, and uh, it has also a historic core in the 
middle of the city. It's called Kemeraltı, uh, and it is a well-known address for com commercial activities. It is very similar to a historical peninsula uh, in Istanbul because it has also uh, have um, first, second, and third degree archaeological and urban con uh, conservation sites. And uh, similar to the historic peninsula of Istanbul, Kemeraltı region has organic and historic urban pattern, not uh, grid system. And it was not sufficient to meet needs of modern societies, such as uh, access to public uh, spaces, uh, safe, affordable, accessible public transportation, and walkable and bikeable areas. So that uh, Izmir Metropolitan Municipality aimed to recondition uh, Kemeraltı, uh, the historic and economic center, uh, within uh, 250 hectares area, it's a half of uh, Istanbul historic peninsula, and with a more human uh, oriented uh, approach. So they know us because of our experience and reach us. Uh, and uh, we conduct a study in uh, 2016 in order to prepare a guide uh, which contains both analyzes and recommendations to develop. Uh, sustainable transportation solutions. Uh, we also make uh, field works in that area uh, for days. And uh, the most important uh, of these field studies was the survey study. Uh, we applied to uh, them, uh, we applied the survey study to uh, 300 people, which uh, was the residents, cyclists, pedestrians, and tourists uh, in that area. In addition, also shopkeepers. In addition, uh, focus group meetings uh, and workshops with stakeholders also guide the uh, formulation of our recommendations. And we also make uh, traffic and pedestrian countings and uh, make observation studies in the, uh, especially in the public uh, spaces and public areas. And uh, we um, give uh, various strategies. Uh, to make Kemeraltı a qualified, compact, uh, connected and vibrant city center while ensuring safe spaces for its citizens. Uh, as a result of our study, uh, vehicle traffic in the region was restricted. More than um, 100 streets uh, were pedestrianized now and they are keep going. And walking routes were created for people to better understand the historic value and reach the uh, functions. And uh, WRI Turkey's guide was complementary to other studies of Izmir Metropolitan Municipality, such as uh, their restoration plans for the um, buildings and street lighting implementations and logistic plans, for example. So that, as a result, result uh, Kemeraltı was uh, selected for the UNESCO tentative list in April 2020. So now we have uh, two UNESCO heritage lists uh, area uh, in Turkey, and we also um, pedestrianize all the much much of the areas. We are happy for that. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jayan, for sharing some incredible insights about pedestrianization, both from Istanbul as well as from Izmir. Okay, so let's quickly take some of the questions, and I will request uh, uh, to, that you guys you uh, have a slightly brief response. So the first question is for Garima, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, this question is, a lot of time there is an opposition to pedestrianization projects from uh, the shopkeepers who were there. And we know Chandni Chowk is all full of shops. So the question is, how do you manage to convince them so that the period can go ahead? Rightly said, there was a lot of opposition. There is always a lot of opposition to uh, pedestrianization because uh, there are uh, people uh, like people of bullion market, people of uh, toy market. They want, uh, when you're used to a certain kind of a facility that the goods will come straight to the doorstep and the shopkeepers will pack the stuff and the people will just pick up straight from the doorstep and take it. So uh, my answer uh, to the problem was speaking to them, talking to them, telling them of the advantages telling them of how it would benefit them in the uh, long run, how the property prices would go up, how it would become sustainable, and how the, the sales would increase, and eventually they would uh, tend to benefit. We did not uh, force through anything. We just spoke to them. My 
emergencies, convince them, and they came till the time they came on board. Fortunately, all of them came on board. Okay, that's that's super great to hear. The other question is. Uh, uh, from the audience, and again, this is also uh, uh, for you, ma'am. Is that uh, the question? Is when will the facade improvement start for Chandni Chow, and what strategies SRDC planning to adopt? Uh, will it be uniform? So we are in the process of hiring a consultant who will give us ideas of improvement. So we will look at various options available and then decide. We intend to conserve the havelis, the preserve the havelis the way they are, and do minimum uh, amount of tampering with them and restore them as they as they are. And obviously, uniform signages and uh, uniform uh, color of the paint of uh, new buildings is one of the other aspects that can be looked into. We will we will look at various options and decide. And it is going to happen soon. We are in the process of uh, doing it. Okay, perfect. Yes, that's great to hear. So, Chidam, one question for you, uh, and this has come, uh, is that, uh, so a lot of times, uh, so we start with one street, one area to pedestrianize, but in Turkey, what we have seen between 2011 to 2013, about 250 streets were pedestrianized is in Istanbul. So, how did the government went from one street to 250 street? Because that is something which we'd love to learn from the experience in Turkey. Yes, uh, as I mentioned, uh, they started uh, in the uh, from the squares. There are many squares in the historic peninsula, and they are also historic. They are important. Uh, they have important monuments and historic places around them. So they started as a, a core areas uh, from the squares, and they started to. Um, uh, spread them uh, in the periphery and then they uh, just connect the squares from each other so uh, in the end uh, they uh, pedestrianize all the area it's, it's it's like a virus the squares they use the uh, squares as a virus in the area so uh, it's it became uh, easily to conduct uh, to pedestrianize to pedestrianize all the area uh, that's uh, what they do Okay, that's great to hear. Uh, Ma'am, one more question uh, for you is, in fact, two questions. One, how did you manage parking? Because the images that we saw, there were vehicles all around and a lot of them were parked. So how did you address the parking in Chandni Chow? So we are uh, creating two parking spaces majorly. Uh, one is in the Dangal Maidan and one is in the Gandhi Maidan. Both are in the process of uh, you know, various phases of development. And we also assessed, we did a detailed study of the number of uh, vehicles coming into the area. Obviously, parking space, because the space is limited with the uh, current parking spaces that we have created, we should be able to cater to the uh, parking uh, problem of the area. Okay. So the same question is for Chidem. Chidem, I had a for, uh, good fortune of visiting the historic peninsula once. And I saw there are a lot of people who reside there. So how do you manage parking of people who are residents of that area in the historic peninsula? Uh, can you repeat your question, Amit? So in Istanbul historic peninsula, a lot of people live there. So how do you manage parking of the residents of that area? Mm -hmm. Actually, um... In the pedestrian area, there are not, not uh, much more people living in there. Uh, there are a lot of hotels and uh, universities and palaces and commercial areas. So that's why it is very uh, not safe, safe uh, in the uh, evening. Uh, so a municipality uh, implement another action plan for uh, the safety of this area for the in the evening because as i mentioned before uh, there are two and a half million people are walking in the streets in the day daytime but uh, there are very limited people uh, in the evening so uh, the, the residents are uh, especially are living in the periphery of this pedestrian area so that was not a problem but the problem was the shopkeepers uh, vehicles 
so the municipality make uh, some uh, parking areas uh, in the periphery of this area so they solve the problem like that okay that's that's really good to hear uh, very well ma'am uh, there's one more question there are two parts to this question one is people want to know who are the design consultants uh, for this project that's one and second is how are you managing loading and unloading of vehicles because there's a huge commercial area in chandni chow yes so the design consultant is psda pradeep sachdeva pradeep sachdeva is a design consultant and uh, loading and unloading the local body the body has provided us with nine sites uh, which have been designated and these sites have been uh, identified in consultation with the local body with the stakeholders with the traffic police with the local police the bays have been identified and those places will be used for a loading and unloading uh, during the uh, uh, permitted hours okay so one last question uh, before we close uh, is uh, the the uh, chandni chowk area in pradesh 9 is there any plan to expand that network to beyond this one one and a half kilometer uh, yes as i said in my last slide this is just the first bit this is a demonstrative uh, thing which we have done we ultimately aim to pedestrianize the whole wall city obviously pcl because as you know that the area is severely congested and uh, densely populated we cannot go a uh, full blown uh, area redevelopment but of course we are planning a redevelopment of the jama masjid precinct uh, redevelopment of the area around the new delhi railway station the red fort uh, crossing area and eventually uh, the arterial roads of chandni chowk the other uh, streets in in inward streets of chandni chowk and eventually the entire uh, wall city in small piece means we in then could be develop the entire thing and that is what ajanabad means ajanabad means the old world city of delhi thanks a lot so so exciting to hear that i think the conversation is moving beyond just one street super exciting so with this uh, i think we have come to the end of this session uh, i know we can probably continue for one more hour the subject is so interesting and we have such great speakers but again we are running out of time we have another session planned so before i formally close i would once again like to thank all the panelists uh, especially uh, ms garima gupta uh, mr rishab uh, gupta as well as chidam uh, from uh, our colleague from wri turkey as well as uh, my colleague priyanka sulkan for this wonderful insightful session so thank you once again so we will now move to session 2 uh, the session 2 is about improving safety and experience on commute to schools this session will actually focus on what why and how to introduce safer access to school with a special focus on road safety intervention uh, in the larger context of policy development and also understanding the needs of children and with special needs in the legislation around it so let's move to session 2 and once again thank you everyone for the great first session Hello everyone. Welcome to Connect Core 2021 and to the session on improving safety and experience around schools. I am Rohit Dak from WRI India and I will be moderating this part of the session. In this session we will try to understand why we need to look at improving safety and children's experience around schools. What is being done on ground in and around Delhi to introduce safer school zones? and how children's access to schools and road safety interventions considering children with special needs and the legislation around it is being investigated addressed and implemented at the global and the national level so let's first start with why do we need safer access to schools with cities rapidly urbanizing the way we plan design and build an urban environment will play a crucial role in ensuring children's well-being their mental and physical growth and safety for this it's important to understand what are children's rights and expectations from the city every child has a right to safe streets clean air play and explore urban settings freely right to personal safety in urban and public spaces right to equity to use the city and thrive right to education and right to be heard cities should be fully developed to allow allow children to experience the urban environment safely 
with all the potential that the interaction with the city can offer. And here I would like to quote Enrique Penalosa, the former mayor of Bogota, who had famously said, and I quote, children are kind of indicated species. If we can build a city successful for children, it will be successful for everyone. And uh, on the same line, if we have streets which are designed for children, understanding their rights, understanding their expectations from the city, those streets um, will be safer for all the street users. Now let's take a look at children and road safety in India. The data suggests that India is a home to about 472 million children between the age group 0 to 18. Currently around 27% of these children live in the urban areas, that is the cities. And this number is bound to increase as 40% of India's population will live in the cities by 2030. The children's road safety data also suggests that every day 43 children die due to traffic crashes on Indian streets, and which is a huge number. It also further states that 40% of these crashes happen on the urban streets. Children who face or even witness road crashes go through travel anxiety and many other post-traumatic consequences. So in order to address the safety related issues pertaining to children, uh, whether it's road safety or whether it's personal, personal safety or to um, retrofit children's rights and expectations in the city, the city should begin transformation at strategic areas. And school is one such destination that a child commutes to almost every day. Children spend around 1,500 hours per year per child in the schools. A significant amount of time is spent on schools related commutes. And lastly, as access to education is a right of every child, so should be the safer access to schools. In order to introduce safer access to schools in Delhi and CR and other parts of the country, we at WRI follow a robust approach which involves three main steps that is count it, change it and scale it. Count it involves comprehensive assessment of child safety in cities, which involves understanding what are the school locations, what are the crashes happening in the city, overlaying the, uh, a lot of these um, parameters and identifying schools which need immediate intervention. It involves enhancing safety around these schools through preliminary demonstrations and trials, mainly through tactical urbanism. And scale it involves positively impacting decision making to scale up the efforts to um, either policy work, guidelines or toolkits. To help us understand our ongoing efforts to implement safer commute to schools in Delhi and CR, I would like to invite my colleague Ashima Bhandari. Over to you, Ashima. Um, thank you so much, Rohit. Uh, let me just share my screen. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, WRI India has been working a lot of road, road child, uh, child road safety projects uh, in the state of Haryana and guiding cities in initiating systemic road, uh, road ch design changes, building infrastructure that is safe for all road users and formulating laws and other measures to ensure safer mobility. Uh, as in the scenario for the child road safety worldwide, children accounts for 21% uh, road traffic fatalities. And whereas in India, child road fatalities accounts for seven times uh, more than the other accidents. Uh, whereas in Haryana, we recorded 1843 child fatalities uh, in the year of 2018. And in Gurgaon, in 2018, we recorded 442 road fatalities, not specifically children. And in Rotak, we recorded 241 fatalities uh, out of 521 road crashes, which were reported. So children road safety is a global concern as more than 500 children are killed in car crashes every day. Talking about the safer access to schools methodology, we've been working on this methodology in most of our projects, starting with the identification of the school zones, which is backed up by a strong blackboard analysis and the fatalities data in the state of Haryana. And then studying the school assessment, the in-focus school study, uh, school zone study, 
and following uh, following up with the stakeholder engagement and the data collection which is the major part of most of our projects in which we we've been doing a lot of focus group discussions surveys to study the mobility pattern of the students and collecting the data through various perception studies and the capacity building workshops and then the school zone design for uh, following up with implementation and monitoring and evaluation we started with this project safer commute for ch school children in rohtak in may 2018 in partnership with the municipal corporation of rohtak rohtak police and nascom foundation the vision was to uh, to transform rohtak into a city where children can travel safely on the road either by foot cycle or transit and the respective of whether they are accompanied by an adult or on their own the project was divided into four strategies to work on the first was assessing all modes of travel which were available to children in the city and improving the un most unsafe modes and then capacity building of the city officials identifying the routes and areas frequently used by children and improving them with respect to safety and security in terms of improving road infrastructure and traffic management to mitigate uh, crash risk and then the stakeholder engagement in terms of media outreach and the ragiri day so uh, in rohtak uh, we did partnership with five schools and then we did the focus group discussions with the schools uh, with these schools with children parents and teachers and then the detailed surveys to know about their uh, mobility pattern and uh, we did the surveys with uh, around 4400 uh, students and then we did the workshop with uh, five workshops and two ragiri campaigns the next we did the capacity building workshops with engineers and police and the workshop was mostly uh, uh, based on the awareness uh, uh, presentations and the site visits and designing of the critical junctions and all these uh, exercises were part of the workshops and then the tactical urbanism the trials and analysis while studying the mobility pattern of the children and other Uh, uh, perception studies we could clearly find the selection of priority stretches which was a th 13 km of stretch and on these 13 km stretch we did the trial interventions on 10 junctions and then the uh, followed up by conflict analysis for these 10 junctions which were the uh, impact study of these trial interventions the project was ended in uh, 2020 and now we are in the second phase of this project which is based for the youth of the rohtak the next project we did in gurgaon vision zero for youth safer school zone gurgaon uh, we started with this project in september 2019 the vision of the project was to create a safer commute environment for children and developing a scalable zone model we try to um, you know convert the study or the project into three main model three main strategies one was the model shift in which we try to increase the walking and cycling around the schools we try to make this that specific school street for streets for all and then the environment in changing the environment in terms of uh, increasing the greens in that area and making more active zones the stakeholder for this project was uh, municipal corporation district administration ragiri foundation schools and councillor and rws at sector level we did the focus uh, group discussions with five schools but uh, in detail study we did with the two schools one one is the was the uh, one school was in high posh areas and another one was high crowded area in the gurgaon and then we did uh, partnership with five schools focus group discussions with students parents and teachers and we did the surveys to know about their mobility pattern and then uh, we did a workshop which was a community engagement which was a model of engagement to know the perception of students by giving them the route maps and they were walking on those roads and marking what they want from these roads and their perception of that study and then we did two ragiri campaigns and two tactical urbanism uh, uh, trials the school street which was the main focus of this project was divided into four main strategies one was prioritizing sustainable modes and uh, by increasing the walkways roundabouts and crossings and then engaging elements making the street more engaging by providing wall art surface art and street art and then inclusive system in terms of mz zones pick up and drops for the parents and um, race crossings to slow down the speed of vehicles and then child centric planning in the near uh, nearby uh, vacant plot so we clearly could get the the, the design on this main stretch uh, in terms of footpath and mz surfaces and wall art 
and uh, correcting the intersections and providing the footpaths and ro uh, road crossings so these were the main highlights of the trial we did the active we provided the active zones for children street play was there surface i was there this was the outcome of this project when we did the trial the trial was huge success and it was there for a week Uh, so this was a one kind of uh, scalable model for the city of gurgaon for other schools also this was one school we did in the previous uh, project we did the focus group discussions and then we promoted this school under the streets for people challenge as a neighborhood site and the trial for this conducted uh, on 20th of march so it is clearly visible that uh, the area in front of the school was fully encroached by the two wheelers vendors and the three wheeler rickshaws so we reclaimed the full area and we provided the engaging elements and the uh, for children on this full area and restricted the vehicle entry on this area this trial was there for a month and this was also a huge success then we have sepur out to school gurgaon this project was for two cities in india one is for gurgaon and another for mumbai we started uh, with this project approach of ws approach uh, counted change it and scale it we've been working on counted stage and which was the comprehensive assessment of crash data and child safety uh, child safety in cities and in this counted stage we've been working on city level analysis identification of at risk schools and studying the profiles of high risk schools so in the methodology of this project we located the schools of gurgaon on road network of that uh, road network of gurgaon city and then uh, sort of providing the 500 meter patchet for the schools of these areas and overlaying the fatal crashes on these locations in getting the schools at risk and then further getting the schools which are at high risk which would be having the highest fatalities in their pet shed in gurgaon we clearly saw the that 46% of the schools in gurgaon had more than three fatalities within their 500 meters of pet shed and we got 10 schools we which had more than 10 fatalities within their 500 meter pet shed which was the higher which were the high risk schools and then these 10 high risk schools were located in outskirts of gurgaon and out of these 10 schools two clusters are formed for two schools and six high risk schools were at distinct locations so in these 10 schools we had almost approximately 5400 students studying so this was the first phase of this project in which we did the uh, detailed profile study of these schools and gave the general recommendation for safety measures uh, going forward we'll be working on the change at stage of this project uh, where we would be enhancing safety around schools through trials and demonstration and we'd, we would be engaging with the local authorities in site selection we would be doing the road uh, safety inspections and implementing the road safety measures for these schools that's all if you have any questions please reach out to me i'll be happy to answer those questions thank you so much thank you ashwini if you can um, remain yeah, for I'll a minute um, yeah. so um, there is a question that you know uh, how were children involved in the process of transformation um, on ground like uh, was it public participatory and if so how were the stakeholders and children were part of it okay so in detail if we talk about the gurgaon and uh, rohtak project so we did these focus group discussions and the surveys where we could clearly see the what was the perception of the students and through the surveys we could actually get the detailed study of the students that what exactly they want from the states and what exact risk they are facing while traveling to the schools so this was the uh, feedback which we got from them which we tried to implement on the designs while doing these interventions obviously first of all the design was part of their perception another thing is when we did the interventions we obviously we invited them to be part of those interventions and they helped us in gurgaon they clearly helped us while doing all the work for the interventions all right thank you and like ashima just mentioned in most of the projects children were a part of the transformation it's also yeah. a way to empower children that give them a platform not just to be heard but also allow them to make changes on ground that gives a kind of empowerment to children and also help them um, become the change maker for the change they want to see once again thank you ashima for presenting this work and uh, we will continue with the session now we will begin with the next part of the session this session focuses on understanding the what why and how of creating safer commuter schools 
and we will be discussing about the role of policy framework to introduce and reinforce children's safety in cities as they access schools. To help us understand this better, we have two eminent speakers, Ms. Natalie Drazen and Dr. Anjali Agarwal. Both are globally known for their contribution in the field of safer and inclusive mobility for children and youth. The session will begin with the speaker introduction followed by their presentation, and in the end, there will be a brief questions and answers session. Let me introduce our first speaker, Ms. Natalie Drazen, the director at North American Office and the United Nations representative at FIA Foundation. Natalie is dedicated to ensuring safe and sustainable mobility as a policy priority and leads the FIA Foundation's activities around Americas and advanced um, advances evidence based solutions focused on equity around the world. With her efforts, she has ensured the inclusion of road safety in the UN Sustainable Development Goals and founded Vision Zero for Youth with the National Center for Safe Routes to School. Utilizing the pandemic as an opportunity to make streets safe for all, she has authored UNICEF's guidance around preventing COVID-19 and road traffic injuries on the journey to school. Welcome, Natalie. Good to have you at Connect Karo and over to you. Thank you so much, Rohit, and thank you for, for having me and for this opportunity to speak with you. Um, I'm very excited to talk to you today about guidance on how to prevent road traffic injuries and COVID, as well as uh, Vision Zero for Youth. And my hope is that this will be particularly helpful to you as children head back to school. Um, I also want to thank Rohit for, for advancing my slides. I feel bad I can't do them from here for some reason. So um, Rohit, if you would mind going ahead and sharing, that would be wonderful. Sure, Nathan. Thank you. I'll just give you a brief overview of uh, our work as we begin. Um, the FIA Foundation on the second slide, you'll see hosts the Child Health Initiative. And in the Child Health Initiative, we work with WRI uh, and a number of others. Um, and we believe in several key rights of the child. Um, at the heart of all of these rights of the child is the safe systems approach or the foundation of Vision Zero. And I really wanna thank WRI for their hard work in implementing this in Haryana, Punjab and Rajasthan. And later I'll talk a little bit more about Vision Zero for youth. I just want to first talk about, um, about what's going on right now. I, I wanna express my sadness at the COVID situation in India, and I, I hope you and your family and your friends are safe. Now, as we grapple with this very tragic pandemic, we are of course thinking about how to kid send kids back to school safely. And now they face two threats on their journey to school. COVID-19 and road traffic injuries. Globally, we lose about 500 children every single day on our roads, but actually many of the interventions in this guidance, and you see the 10 points of this guidance right here that address one risk also address the other and their low cost. Um, so this is what we see in this guidance, these 10 key actions to help ensure safe and healthy journeys to school during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. And today I'll touch on just a couple of these examples. And I really do wanna thank Rohit and WRI for their input because this is how we came up with this guidance was asking our partners what they are doing on the ground to send kids back to school safely during this pandemic. Now, one of the main focuses of this guidance is allowing for physical distancing at drop off and pick up to reduce the risk of COVID-19 and to make it safer to walk and cycle. Because when more students can safely walk to school, we also have less air pollution. There are many low cost ways to create more space around the school entrance. We can even use paint or bricks or rocks to help students line up outside and against the school building, of course, rather than near the street. Why ideally it's best to close the street traffic, the street to traffic um, during drop off and pickup hours. And I know it might be hard to close the whole street, but just closing one lane of traffic can really make an enormous difference. And this is an example from London, but we're seeing it all over the world. 
And monitoring and evaluation is so important. Um, it's especially important to making temporary changes permanent. So please think about determining what success looks like from the start and measuring indicators to get there. That's making it safe to walk and cycle to school and use a wheelchair. And this is our chance to make the school journey safe for all road users. And I know that my co-presenter will have plenty of other wonderful ideas for how to do this. If you make streets safe for students with disabilities, they'll be safe for everybody. So that's caregivers pushing strollers or grandparents picking up their grandkids on the way to school and coming home too. You'll see why reducing speeds to 30 kilometers an hour is the most crucial step. This is not an arbitrary number. It's recommended by the WHO as a best practice because high speeds are often the greatest threat for children on roads and low speeds are like a vaccine against road traffic injuries. Slower speeds make it less likely that a child will be hit and more likely that if unfortunately they are, they will survive. Fully deploying COVID vaccines, as we know, takes a really long time, especially to reach our children, but we can use the speed vaccine that we have now. But I also wanna put in a plug for UN Global Road Safety Week, which by the time you're seeing this may have already passed, but the impact of it will carry through all the way to the high level meeting on road safety in 2022. The theme for this is lower speeds and our call to action is for 30 kilometers an hour where vulnerable road users and vehicles mix. So if you go online to this website, you'll find a comprehensive campaign pack to ask leaders to implement their safer speeds. So again, this doesn't have to just happen during UN Global Road Safety Week. Our hope is that these campaign materials will live on and, and be helpful even past this. And this is my ask of you today. If you are a decision maker, please consider lowering speeds to save lives. It's necessary to not just fighting road traffic injuries, but also really to pandemic recovery. Because of the pandemic, lowering speeds has never been so politically and publicly palatable. And hopefully we will never get this excuse to lower speeds quite like this again. So let's make life-saving changes while we can. And if you're not a decision maker, please go to this website and check out the materials you can use to ask your decision maker to lower speeds. Uh, in response to COVID-19, Vietnam launched a school speed enforcement initiative where police issue reminders in school zones about speed limits in the first week, and then they follow up with fines and penalties thereafter. On the next slide, um, where, whereas speed limits really just ask people to slow down, we like self-enforcing roads, infrastructure that's more effective because it forces people to slow down. And that's why many of our partners use raised crosswalks or speed humps or bollards. Our partner, the International Road Assessment Program or IRAP that you see here, helps schools identify the most cost-effective measures through their Star Ratings for Schools app. And I encourage you to check that out online. You can use it. Um, you can see their work in Zambia here in collaboration with our partner, Amend, and the guidance has links to their tools and more. Uh, making it safe also means separating road users from traffic, and I'd like to congratulate the government of India on their low-cost cycling initiatives like this in response to COVID-19. My understanding is that this challenge encourages pop-up cycle lanes and traffic calmed or non-motorized zones. And it also encourages temporary changes to be made permanent. But I would love to learn more about that from all of you. Now, on the next slide, you'll see that routes separated from traffic also enable walking and cycling school buses in which a designated adult picks up a student on a safe predetermined route. This is a photo from China, but again, this is done all around the world. A photo from the UK where cycling school buses can get kids to get outside and get physical activity and stay safe. There's no better way to make roads safer than with the help of students themselves. And before the pandemic, several cities were doing this through Vision Zero for Youth. Vision Zero for Youth recognizes that children can be an excellent starting point for Vision Zero. And we can, and we must achieve zero through this population. And in the same vein, all Vision Zero plans should include youth. Zero is actually possible. In, in youth, the city of Bogota, Colombia achieved this over several months. Sometimes the tragedies tick back up, but they figure out what's wrong and then they aim for zero again. They recognize that zero is not a constant state. 
but it's a constant goal and we have to adapt to meet it. You'll see we did Vision Zero for Youth in Mexico City, where just like in India, about 60 to 65% of kids walk to school. And students were asked what kind of changes they wanted to see to make schools safer. And together with the community, they got out the buckets of paint and they actually implemented those changes. Now on the next slide, you'll see a girl I remember speaking to in Mexico City. Um, she pointed to this crosswalk you see behind her and she said, I did this. I kept myself and my peers safe. Can you imagine the feeling of empowerment she felt and what a lasting impact on her. She might've even thought about you know, a career as an engineer. Um, and this is just an example of the important role that students have to play. Just how incredible it is uh, to use paint and paint can help give streets back to people. And I know that Rohit and his team have many excellent examples of this in India. Just check out this intervention by our partner NACTO before the pandemic and now after in Fortaleza, Brazil. Um, that's how we can keep people physically distanced while they're walking and cycling, which again, makes it less likely that they will catch COVID. I wanna talk about how to help students walk and cycle and follow protocols because encouraging kids to, to do this is about teaching them to be safe. We all know that teaching a kid to ride a bike is a lifelong skill and teaching them safety measures like wearing a helmet protects them. That's why cities like Bogota, Colombia have a free bike school for kids to learn how to cycle. There's a great example from Addis Ababa on the next slide in Ethiopia, which is encouraging kids to cycle by converting empty parking lots to cycling training grounds during the pandemic. And this helps kids who've been cooped up inside to get out and to walk and bike and play. And right now that is so important to our physical and our mental health. This is just one of the many cities around the world that is also hosting a car free day. And I know there are some in India as well, of course. Uh, this is one of the reasons why they recently won our Vision Zero for Youth Award in Addis Ababa. And, and WRI also included the journey to school in the Ministry of Education reopening plan and is prioritizing high crash areas. Now, this is an example on the next slide from India, where of course, bicycles have to be available in the first place. Um, I love the Cycle for Change Challenge uh, that encourages community-led bike rentals so that low resource settings can also benefit from cycling. And there's bicycle loans and, free, and lessons, uh, free helmets, or even awarding bicycle licenses to students can give them incentives to cycle safely. This is about how to promote hygiene and safety on, on shared transport. Uh, on the next slide, just a reminder, it's so important not just to share tips, of course, with students, but to ask about their challenges. So for example, for women traveling during off-peak hours can help prevent COVID and harassment, which is something you might hear in feedback, um, and also reduces demand on public transportation, making it easier to physically distance and opening it up for people who really do have to use public transportation. Uh, speaking of harassment, on the next slide, we have to identify and engage the populations that will face the most challenges on their journey very early on. Um, on the next slide, you know, Rohi can tell you that in Mumbai, WRI is adapting their work to the pandemic. Uh, safety inspections around schools identified low-cost designs here to, uh, to separate pedestrians and cyclists from traffic. And very simple measures like making sure that parked vehicles don't illegally obstruct walkways and cycleways can make an enormous difference. Far too many students were facing challenges before the pandemic, and they will face even more after, unless we aim for long-term change. Now, on the next slide, you'll see that in Ethiopia's quest to, bring, to build back better, they are prioritizing the journey to school, as I mentioned. They're revising their 10-year non-motorized transport plan to see what can and what should be accelerated because of COVID-19. And what works in Addis Ababa can be scaled nationally. On the next slide, of course, long-term change takes leadership and funding, but city and government resources are overwhelmed and facing, facing budget cuts and wide-scale change is really hard. Uh, so WRI and Addis is overcoming this by integrating many of the actions in this guidance into government plans and prioritizing them through phased reopening. Communicating long-term benefits and catalyzing policy change, of course, starts with data. 
And our website, you see it here, childhealthinitiative.org has plenty of examples for how to collect data to make the journey safer. It also highlights our experience with partners in low and middle income countries on very, very tight budgets. Um, they've made very significant change using low cost, high impact interventions that don't drain resources, but actually result in smarter spending. All of our 10 key actions reflect many of the changes that we've long fought for to ensure safe and healthy journeys to school, uh, which can and should be accelerated because of this pandemic. I want to highlight the database because I'm sure that many of you have examples to share, and I would love to invite you to contribute these examples to our live database. We created it in partnership with Save the Children and UNICEF, and it complements the guidance by sharing real global examples of safe and healthy journeys to school during the pandemic. And you can find it here at childhealthinitiative.org slash COVID-19. Right now, we have an opportunity to make school journeys safe and healthy for all of our kids. We have a chance to implement interventions that are normally a lot harder and take a lot longer. And these interventions help bolster our kids' health as a whole. We have to seize this opportunity and make changes last. And we can and must build back better and safer. So thank you again for joining me and thank you for all of your efforts to keep our kids safe and healthy on the journey to school, even in the most challenging of times. I hope you and your family are safe and healthy during this pandemic. Thank you. Um, thank you, Natalie, for the great presentation. A lot of important points you touch, right from the low speed vaccine for less traffic injuries for all to including not just including rather, but also empowering children and youth and make them uh, one of the decision makers uh, for the change they want to see. And lastly, um, for the low um, and medium income countries um, to use the low cost, high impact implementation um, processes. So uh, a lot to learn from this presentation. Um, I just have one question and then I'll open it up for our viewers to address their questions. Um, so when you build this guidance, how was um, the response? Because I remember in, during the first wave, as we call it, of the pandemic, um, the guidance was prepared and a lot of countries were fortunate enough to open their schools after that. So has there uh, been any impact or what was your experience of working um, with different cities or countries um, with the guidance? Sure, that's a great question. And, you know, thanks to partners like you, we were able to collect more and more examples um, as time went on, because I think as schools are reopening, we are seeing more creative ways to help kids get outside and, and walk and cycle safely. Um, we certainly are encouraging people to go to this database, uh, which has a lot of good examples from around the world. Um, and, and we are working on sharing those examples as well. Uh, I can tell you in the US, one way that we are getting this information out there is through our partner, National Center for Safe Routes to School and Johns Hopkins University. Uh, we are forming a group of major US organizations that are focused on getting kids back to school and offering that expertise to our Department of Transportation uh, as a way that they can channel these resources and this guidance to push it out to communities. So that might be something that other countries may also want to consider is to bring together experts in this area and link those experts very much to their ministries of transportation uh, to work together. Because of course, ministries are overwhelmed and they may welcome the opportunity to tap into such a resource. Uh, so that might be something to consider in pushing out such guidance. So there is one question, Natalie, which is um, so if if uh, a certain city or government needs to, uh, you know, adopt the the guidance uh, used, then is what is the procurement process? Um, do they need to approach uh, via foundation or UNICEF or how that needs to be done in a systematic way? And what kind of support um, will you be given to these cities? There is no process. The process is simply go online and use the guidance at your leisure. Uh, it is intended to be a free resource that is available to anyone um, because we believe that safe and healthy journeys to school should be available to everybody, regardless of uh, level of, of resource. And we have a lot of uh, resources on our site that are very low cost 
uh, to use or can be adapted to the level of um, time and expertise and resource that you have. Um, that said, we are always available uh, to talk through this and brainstorm and help address problems. Um, there's, you saw my email address on there and I would love to be contacted so that we can help in any way. Um, and I also hope that the database would be helpful to uh, look across to other cities that have faced similar challenges and are doing similar work so that we can share across borders as well. Um, I should also mention, by the way, UNICEF has given um, three very small grants um, around the world to implement this database and so hopefully there were this uh, guidance and so hopefully there will be very robust case studies coming out of that that we would love to share with you um, that can help other cities looking to do the same. Totally, thank you. There's a question from um, uh, Akila. Um, she wants to know, uh, you know, if can you take us through um, some of the co-benefits that cities can hope, um, you know, to see while improving um, commute environments to school? I love this question. Thank you so much. Um, so let's see. Walking and cycling to school is the goal, right? We want to reduce dependency on private vehicles. And what that does is reduce congestion, which is often dangerous, particularly to small children whose bodies can't sustain the same amount of impact as we can. And it's also great for reducing air pollution. But there's a couple of other less obvious things that happen when more kids walk and cycle to school. Um, businesses, informal or formal, actually do a lot better when people are walking or cycling past them. It's easier for people to stop in and buy something quickly. So often we see that businesses really like this. Um, of course, there's so many health benefits, right? Getting our kids walking and cycling reduces non-communicable diseases. It reduces obesity and diabetes. It also really helps them connect with their community. Um, so this can foster a sense of security for children um, and a sense of security for the community because when you have more kids around, you generally have a safer community as well. Uh, so there's a couple of very obvious things like reducing air pollution and reducing road traffic injuries, making it safer for everybody, right? If you reduce speed limits, you're helping everyone, the whole community. Um, but then there's some non-obvious ones like economic growth and reduction of non-communicable diseases. And um, perhaps I'm forgetting some, Rohit, you might want to jump in with any I've forgotten, but those are the ones that come to mind. No, totally. That's, that sums up well. Um, just last question now, Natalie. Um, I know we are in the difficult time um, with, with the pandemic um, and uh, especially in the developing world. So um, while working with different, these different countries and different cities and different organizations, what is the thing that gives um, people like you hope um, that, you know, that change is going to happen in spite of all these difficulties? And that's the last yeah. question. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great question as well. You know, what, what gives me hope, honestly, is the work and I'm not just saying this because I'm, I'm talking to all of you, but the work of NGOs like WRI, who are so incredibly creative um, in working in really difficult spots, tight budgets, challenges like a pandemic, and figuring out, okay, we can, we can leverage the fact that we need to get outside more to also find the co-benefits in walking and cycling right now. There's more political will, there's more public desire to be outside. The world has kind of been forced to realize that walking and cycling is very much the way of the future and it's time to make sure that that's possible, to make it safe. Um, and people like you who are dedicated to doing this are the ones who give me hope. Um, so that's why I appreciate opportunities like this to have this discussion and hear these really good questions and why I hope you'll reach out and let us know um, how we can be helpful in, in moving your initiatives forward as well. Um, and why I hope you'll contribute to this database at the Child Health Initiative because we truly can learn from each other, especially now I think we've realized that there are no borders in the world, right? We have to share information. Um, 
and what we're seeing in, in cities around the world who are making it possible to walk and cycle is applicable, uh, you know, one across the other. So you are what gives me hope, truly. So thank you. Thank you, Natalie. That was very encouraging. And I am sure all our viewers who are attending are going to benefit a great deal from your presentation. Uh, with that, on that note, I, I really want to thank you for your time, uh, for addressing our um, viewers and uh, being a part of the Connect Caro session. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have our next speaker, Dr. Anjali Agarwal with us. Dr. Anjali Agarwal is Chairwoman and Executive Director of Samarthayam International Center for Accessible Environments. She is an Accessibility and Mobility Specialist, Researcher and Author. She, she co-founded Samarthayam in 1993, which has a consultative status with the United Nations Economic and Social Council since 2015. She is a member of CSO Standing Committee, Niti Ayog, and the Government of India, where she promotes the awareness of sustainable development goals and disability inclusive agenda 2030. And Dr. Anjali co authored the National Building Code 2016 and harmonized guidelines and space standards, which are now the first national accessibility standards used pan India. Her pioneering efforts in the past 27 years have resulted in the launching of flagship Accessible India campaign by the Prime Minister's Office and the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment to make India accessible. As a woman with disability herself and a PhD in non-handicapping environment, Dr. Anjali believes in active advocacy and has been instrumental in making policy level changes to make incredible India an inclusive one. On that note, I'd like to welcome Anjali and I'm happy to have you at the um, 2021. And over to you. Thank you, Rohit. Uh, thank you so much for that kind introduction. I'm really happy to be on the panel um, and being a speaker on accessible environment and looking at the school accessibility. Um, thank you to WRI for uh, the CTA event and look forward to the question answer sessions after my presentation as well. All right. So um, as you're seeing the first slide on the screen and it says safer access to school. Um, I purposely thought that um, actually when we think about schools, we think about the children and more so we think about the teachers. So the first slide itself explains that only if the child is able to commute to the school safely, then only the child can uh, access the learning and uh, teaching learning environment of the school and uh, be mainstream with other children in the school itself. So it, the, the entire learning that starts for a child under the developing years, it happens from the school. So why not we think about making the schools accessible? Hence, the entire presentation will go around what can be done, what are the laws and legislations in our country, and what is the kind of policy framework that, that actually mandates accessibility of the school through safer commuting of children and I'm going to talk about children with disabilities. Uh, just a bit about our, my organization, Samarthyam. Already uh, Rohit has given uh, the introduction, but I just wanted to let you know that uh, Samarthyam is an organization of persons with disabilities and we founded it in 1993. In these 28 years of our journey, we have been able to work in consultation with the United Nations. We are members of many uh, uh, high level organizations uh, like uh, Niti Ayo, uh, the Accessible India Campaign under the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment, uh, Ministry of Urban Affairs, uh, the institute called National Institute of Urban Affairs. And we are looking at the designs of the smart cities uh, in partnership with NIUA. We are panel access auditors with Government of India. And we have co-authored several national accessibility standards, including the National Building Code 2016, and the Indian Roads Congress codes uh, on pedestrian guidelines and BRT standards and many others. Uh, we are also a member of the Transport Research Board USA. So uh, under the Samatim, we have two wings. One is the National Center for Accessible Environments that looks after the accessibility standards and also looks at uh, advocacy uh, with the rights-based approach. The other unit that we have is the Women with Disabilities Forum for Action that looks at gender equality, gender empowerment, and also 
uh, access of uh, gender that means girls and women with disability uh, especially to the public infrastructure information communication systems and also transportation systems we all know that we have this universal declaration of human rights we are uh, in we are entitled to equal rights the moment a person a girl or a boy is born we all are entitled to uh, the uh, free and equal right to be in the society in the community and this declaration of uh, human rights also makes it mandatory that every child with disability born with disability or acquired disability also are, are uh, having this human rights now when we talk about human rights and disability rights the first thing that we need to think about is universal accessibility accessibility uh, from the point of view of not just reaching a building or a school infrastructure but accessibility totally encompasses uh, the holistic view that is reach use and exit and here in comes it our uh, requirement for making the school buildings and school campuses accessible and i'm just not going to talk about schools but i'm going to talk about educational institutions so for many children with disabilities it might be so that school is not the right kind of infrastructure where they get early intervention and early rehabilitation processes we will find a lot of children and people with disabilities who will benefit this with this kind of universal accessibility so here i am showing some icons that actually links to some visible disabilities like a child is blind child using a wheelchair someone who's got a um, uh, uh, amputee leg or a uh, or a uh, hand which is an amputee limb somebody who who uses sign language that means somebody is with speech and hearing impairment um low vision children wearing glasses or there would be somebody who is wearing a hearing aid but there are a lot of disabilities which are hidden for example autism cerebral palsy uh multiple sclerosis initial years of multiple disabilities and i'm going to talk about all of these disabilities which are 21 disabilities which are actually identified by the parliament of india under the rights of persons with disability act we have a very strict law of the land in india we have the united nation convention on the rights of persons with disability which is known as the uncrpd which was signed and ratified by the government of india in 2007 we also have an indian strategy by the united nation scap which actually mandates a disability decade from 2013 to 2022 then we have the accessible india campaign which i'm going to talk about in detail uh, and then we have the rights of Uh, uh right to education act 2009 which actually looks at the right of child with disability and child without disability and what kind of compulsory education mandates have been given into this act and finally the, the rights of persons with disability act 2016 it's not a new act it came up in 1995 and after 10 years uh, there was a harmonization with the crpd then we made it little more stringent and little more tighter in terms of accessibility norms so talking about the united nation convention on the rights of persons with disability uh, there is an article 9 on accessibility and the article 10 and 11 also mandates accessibility to public buildings and schools we are all aware about the sustainable development goals and the mandates under the goals on quality education which is actually it talks about education we link it to quality and inclusive education which is goal number 3 the accessible india campaign was launched in 2015 by the prime minister's office along with the ministry of social justice and empowerment and it mandates accessibility on equal basis with others in the physical environment such as uh, the built environment the roads and transportation systems as well as the information communication technology and it looks at all the services and facilities which are open to the general public that is the public uh, who doesn't have any kind of disability so services facilities infrastructure which is open to all people without disabilities needs to be mandatory accessible for people with disabilities both in the urban and rural areas the 
the rights of persons with disability act was uh, being uh, looked at by people with disabilities and the organization and civil society organization to harmonize it with the uh, united nation convention but we also tried to make it more contextualized to look at the indian context so ultimately the act came up in 2016 and we looked at uh, uh, this act in many many ways to uh, get it synchronized with other rights of uh, people in the country so the first and the most uh, important right that comes up is always education and health and then when we talk about uh, right to education there was a uh, mandate by government of india which was the right of education act 2009 which talks about that every child has a right to access opportunities given in the educational services irrespective of the class caste race gender geographical origin and abilities this is very important 